Okay, it's weird for me because I'm used to all this. All right, so uh, firstly, let's address the elephant in the room. Uh, not me, but uh, <laughs> let's address the elephant in the room. Uh, this is not something I'm used to. This is my first TED talk. So I'm used to a very different audience. Uh, I'm not used to following Padma Shri apps and all. So if you're expecting something great, lower it a lot. <laughs> a lot. <clears throat> but uh, I'm also used to a very responsive and uh, attentive and very high energy audience. So could I have that from you guys? Let's just have a huge round of applause. Thank you. Uh, also, one more thing before I start, uh, because I've been in this shoes, let's just have a huge round of applause for Twitch for just holding the whole day together. Let's just... Now we record this and use the footage. <laughs> but, uh, alright, so as I said before, uh, I've, I've seen all these wonderful speakers, uh, I've seen their achievements, and I feel very out of place because man, basically, Chukhule Sunatao. So, uh, I feel very out of place right now. Like, like just look, have one look at themselves as a blazer, as nice dark of clothes. Mess up, be nice, stick a shirt, man. So, I feel a little weird. Uh, even yesterday, we all met yesterday together, we met for dinner. Everybody's all being classy, being all sophisticated, and you know, all diggers, yoga stuff. And I'm just there thinking, yeah, Raj, free dinner, I'm going to get That's wrong, man. But right now, uh, unlike what has uh, said, I'm not actually going to just do jokes. Uh, I do that all the time and also charge money for it. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try and add some value to your life uh, in, in the next 10 odd minutes. Uh, I'm going to talk about something that's close to my heart. Uh, so I can't, as I said, I have no achievements to speak of, so I, I can't really give you any advice or anything. Nor am I self-absorbed or interesting enough to talk about my own journey. So I have only one area of expertise and that is comedy. So I'm going to talk about comedy if that's okay with you. I'm going to talk about how uh, there's a perception of comedy right in India right now, especially apart from the bubble of comedy fans. Most of us, most of the people in India look at comedy as something that snobs do, uh, shameless people do. It's, it's got a bad reputation, it's got a bit of a bad rep right now. So I'm going to try and show you a different side of comedy. I'm going to try and show you how uh, doing comedy, performing comedy, writing comedy has improved me uh, as a person, as a human being. So these are my life lessons from stand-up comedy. Uh, number one, number one is to be just be very practical. We're in an age where we tend to romanticize everything, and stand-up comedy is the opposite of that. Because in comedy, you're basically pointing out flaws and talking about them and laughing at them. For example, a couple of years ago, couple of years ago, there was this trend to talk about pandas. Do you guys remember that? The pandas were all the rage. They're so cute. They're so nice. So cuddly. Right? We love pandas. You know, they're so happy. They're so carefree. So one of the first jokes I ever wrote was about pandas. But I was like, you know what, you're wrong. This is not true. Because pandas, they are not happy. This is a fact that pandas are almost endangered species because they refuse to have sex out of choice. <laughs> like imagine how depressed you are. <laughs> when you're locked in a cage with the opposite sex, the whole species depends on you. Even then you both look at each other and go, yeah, these are bamboo khadar. <laughs> So that's what stand-up comedy maybe is. It's like a logical voice of reason. So it's really helped me in life because it, this has seeped into my personality as well. So I did my MBA, I graduated last year from my MBA and after that I totally quit that night just to do comedy. And uh, people often tell me, Dhruv, you're so brave, you're so courageous. And I take the compliment because it's not But But then to be very honest, it is not really brave, it is perfectly calculated. Like I know what is going to quench my materialistic thirst and I know what is going to quench my artistic thirst. You guys like, I think I think he mentioned on, on the bio it was written that I have written IFA. You guys saw this year's IFA? Yes. The nepotism rock joke? Yes. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But then, you guys see that joke and go, cheat ya ganda joke mara. But then, I look at that joke and I go, you know what? Kisi garib artist ka ghar, us joke pe chal rahe. So that's how, that's how I look at life. You don't, you have, you don't have to romanticize everything. People have this saying, you know, it's very extreme. He quit your job, forget the money, follow your dreams. I don't agree with that. Look, I'm a stand-up comedian, I love doing comedy, I love that I can make a living out of just cracking jokes. But is it my dream? No. My dream was to be a football player for Liverpool FC. <laughs> Stop laughing. <laughs> In TikTok, I I But that was my dream, but obviously it couldn't happen because uh, these are issues and all this. <laughs> 
it could have happened, but then then I decided to, you know what, that's not my that is that is that is not a dream that I can follow. Like what gives me the right? What gives any artist the right to look at a guy doing a corporate job, the guy, the guy doing a test job and say, you know what, you're just a corporate slave, you didn't follow your dreams. What if his work was his passion? What if his work was his passion? Or what if what if he's grown up, he's look, he's looked at his parents, you know, struggling with money. Won't his need for money not be a worthy passion? Won't his need to give a family a better lifestyle not be a worthy passion? The key difference here, I feel, is need. It is not my dream to make people laugh. I dream about being a dinosaur also, it's not. <laughs> it is my need, it is my basic need just to go and, you know, make people laugh. It is my basic need just to get that high. So that's the first lesson I learned from standard comedy is that forget the dreams, dreams can be random. Just be practical and follow your needs. Uh, number two is to always be composed. Now, uh, in the second open mic, the second time I ever went on stage, I got heckled. Anybody here know what a heckler is? Yeah? Tell me. One who tries to uh, tell you, like, tell you how it's done. Correct. Okay. Someone who will... Not someone. Over enthusiastic bridge. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so all the time. Correct, correct. So a heckler is someone who will try to disrupt your performance, yes. you know, interrupt your performance by usually saying something mean, nasty, which is not required. So this happened to me in my second open mic. I was on stage and this guy, uh, this this big guy, you know, sitting in the front row, this big, bulky, muscular, like steroid se kahani wala looking guy, <laughs> sitting in the front row. I forgot this one joke, I just went like, uh, and this guy looks at me and goes, ha 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 ha. Like, you know, in a mocking and derisive tone. For a second, I was rattled, but then I just said the first thing that came to my mind. I just looked at him and said, wow, thanks for coming, mom. <laughs> That's all. Now see, that is such a weird thing today to say. It's not, a, it's not a funny thing, it's not a witty thing. But the audience loved it, they appreciated it. Why? Because I was composed. I didn't stoop down to his level and get angry. I feel like that's one thing you have to remember. When I'm on stage right now, I'm the most audible and visible person in the room right now. It's not just a power, it's also a responsibility. I owe it to all of you to be composed right now on stage. So that's what I feel is very important. When you're dealing with naysayers, like the Hector who was there with me, when you're dealing with naysayers, the only thing to remember is I'm not going to let this person throw me off my path. You know, my priority is my journey. It could have taken me, so what happened is it was a four minute spot. He hated me at the third minute. You know, if I wanted to win that argument, maybe I could, but I would have lost my time, I would have lost my audience. So instead, I just moved on. I said that one time, it silenced him. The audience came to my side and I won that open mic. For the first time in my life, I won that open mic. Now that was a very proud moment. And after the open mic, I went and even smiled at him. He didn't smile back. <laughs> but you know what? I'm a better comedian today. I can uh, handle hecklers better today. But that smile will always remain my favorite comeback. So that's the point I would like to remember. Always be composed because you owe it to your audience. Uh, number three is to acknowledge media pretty. Now, anybody here who's been to an open mic? Yeah, you mean the open mic? They look so disappointed that they are. <laughs> because that's what open mics are. It's young, new people trying out new jokes, or even old people, uh, professional comedians trying out new jokes. So there are many bad jokes. Trust me, many bad jokes. But when you go there, there are two types of comics. One, those who will crack bad jokes and move on without any self awareness. And second, those who will crack bad jokes and they'll acknowledge it. They'll say something like, you know what, that's a stupid joke. I don't know, I thought that was funny. And the audience loves the second comic. Because the art form is all about sincerity. Comedy is all about, you know, recognizing your flaws, accepting your flaws, and then making fun of your own flaws. What a beautiful moment that is. Yeah, line tha, guys. Yeah, line tha. It's just the you do. Well planned, well planned. I thought, what am I supposed to do now, right? We can hear you. Carry on with all yours. All mine, but there's no light. Carry on with dark humor. Dark humor, nice. There are kids running behind, I don't think they'll appreciate that. <laughs> this is a great test for my first pen top, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Asa, is there yeah, other lights? Yeah, yeah. You can't see us. Oh, nice. Round of applause for electricity, guys. <laughs> Perfect trolley. Alright, that's pretty good. So, number four, an important point to believe, uh, I believe, is that cynicism is very important. Uh, you guys know what cynics are, like people who will always continuously be negative and point out negative things of everything. Now, stand-up comedy is that. When you're hanging around with comedians, you will always become a cynic. Uh, I'm going to tell you a short anecdote from my life now, uh, if you'll be kind enough to indulge me. <coughs> In the last 10 months, I lost uh, both my grandmother and my grandfather. Now, uh, they were very close to me, like, I, they lived with me and I spent more time with them than with my parents. So, we were like, really close, it was really hard. Uh, my grandfather died first. And you know when someone from a family dies, 
Everybody else, they have those, all the other family members have those cliche phrases that you know what, he had a good life, we did the best we could, we spent so much quality time with them. I had a feeling that I couldn't do that. Because of comedy, there is so much self-awareness, I have lost the ability to lie to myself, even to protect myself. So it was really hard for me. Because I knew that I hadn't been a good dancer to him. Yes, I loved him and I respected him, but I spent more time with my laptop than I did with him. And that was really hard. Knowing that you've been a bad dancer, Wow. Oh. Knowing that you've been a bad grandson to a grandfather who isn't alive anymore is not a good feeling, it's really bad. But after that, I got around 6 months with my grandmother. And nobody spent as much time with her as much as I did. We were always together, we were eating together, we were laughing together, we were binge watching Planet Earth documentaries together. Everything. Sometimes Kapil Sharma, but not my proudest moment. <laughs> everything, we were doing everything together. So what I'm saying is, I got so much quality time with her. The only reason I spent so much time with her, the only reason I got so much quality time with my Ajay was because of this dirty, disrespectful, shameful, immoral, unethical profession called stand-up comedy. That's number four. That's number four that I think is really important. It's okay to be a cynic. Uh, <laughs> now they're just playing a game with you. Yeah, just, it's just a game now. I think I'm just going to like dance or something when it's that, you know? <laughs> I enjoyed it. What? What? It's, cool. it's cool. I've got one last point to go. Is it cool? Go ahead, go ahead, Joe. Is the electricity with me? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. We are with you. Yeah. But the electricity is with you. <laughs> Number five, the most important thing that I really, that was the major point I want to talk about here is punching up versus punching down. It's one thing that people don't know about. You guys are all aware of the controversy surrounding the English stand up comedy scene, yes? We are in Gujarat. You better be here. <laughs> better be here. But. <laughs> it's really important uh, to know about all these controversies. I'll tell you why. Now, when people defend, when non comedians defend stand up comedy, they, say, they often say stuff like, you know what, get over it. You know what, if you don't like it, don't watch it. I actually don't agree with that assertion. If you don't like it, it's okay. You have the right to not like it. Let's have a dialogue. Let's both grow. Why do you have to not watch it? People think that political correctness is bad for comedy. It's not. If I can't use, you know, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, just as a punchline, how is that a bad thing? It's a good thing. What is bad for comedy is that people don't know the basic difference. The basic insight I have to give you, the one that we use to write our jokes. Punching up versus punching down. Now, when we are cracking a punchline, when we are cracking any joke, we are making a joke on someone, we always want to punch up. We want to make jokes on people, figures, power structures that are greater than us, more powerful than us. Assumption being that my joke is not going to hurt. Punching down is when you make jokes on someone that is less privileged or less powerful than you. So it's, th that is something we tend to avoid because why kick someone when they are down? Right, so that's two sides. Now I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, I worked with AIB, as he said recently, uh, for more than about half a year. And uh, I'm probably, I'm not working with them now, so I have no reason to say this. But I have never seen anybody, anybody think as much about their impact as much as AIB. However unbelieving, unbelievable it sounds. Not about consequences, not about kya mein jail jaunga is joke ke liye, but uh, obviously not. But just about impact. What is, what is the message we are sending from this joke? What is the social message? Who are we affecting with this, with this video? Are we punching down upon everyone? Upon anyone? This is the, these are things that they always continuously think about. That's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of India's comedy spectrum, we have Kapil Sharma. Now he makes jokes, he makes jokes about, uh, you know what he makes jokes about, everything, fat shaming, body shaming, uh, women shaming, like cross-dressing shaming, everything. That's okay, he can do what he wants, but here's the problem. Kapil Sharma is regarded as this national comedic treasure. He is. Whereas they are, either they get hate or they get FIRs against them every few months. It's funny to us now, but it's really not to them. Because I've seen it happen, it's really bad. The only inference I can gain from this is that as a nation, as a country, we are embarrassingly okay with punching down on people that can't hit back. But we are still not ready to punch up. We are not brave enough to punch up. Now, politically, this is a huge problem. I'm talking about punching up and punching down, but there is one punch line in USA. You guys know Donald Trump, right? He doesn't need any punch up or punch down. Who the punch line punch down? Now, Donald Trump, you've seen Donald Trump, you know what he's doing. And a major reason I know about everything that Donald Trump or the stupid things he does is because of the US comedians. You guys have seen any talk shows, they continuously talk about it. It's beautiful. It's necessary. And you know what? It helps shape public opinion and plays at least a small role in keeping him in check. What do we have in India? A cute little puppy dog filter. A cute puppy dog filter. 
on the prime minister gets you an FIR, makes you lose gigs, gets you death threats, makes you hire a lawyer, loses you money, you lose brands, you lose audience. Now in this environment, why would, how, why would I or any other comedian be stupid enough to do any political comedy? You see how vicious that cycle is, you see what they are doing. This is, not about, this is not about us, it's about you. They make you believe it's a moral argument, it's not. When, a, when, a, when some politician threatens to ban someone, a politician files an FIR, he's not saying the joke is immoral, no. What he's saying is, this person is above criticism. That's all they're saying. And in a democracy, the most criticized, the most scrutinized person has to be your Prime Minister. That is one thing we don't realize and we really should. Now, another thing that I want to talk about is, uh, the anti-comedian propaganda that these people do. That again, you guys are not aware of that, I just want you guys to know about this and tell, tell as many people as you wish. This anti-comedian propaganda. You guys know this Snapchat fiasco, right? Everybody knows about this, right? Cool. So, when this happened, I was actually abroad. Uh, my dad called me to tell me about this. Uh, my father is a very progressive, level-headed individual, not like, he's, he's very cool. But he called me and he told me, what he told me on the phone, he didn't tell me that, you know what happened? So I we took that puppy, cute little puppy of film, you know that teenagers use adorable women? He took, they took that and they put it on the Prime Minister. I don't agree the joke being that the most powerful person in the country doing something as stupid that a teenager would do. He didn't say that, no. My dad is not on Snapchat. My dad believes newspapers. So what he told me was what most of the country believes. Was just, AIB ne Prime Minister ko kutta banana. <laughs> this is what he told me. How do I defend that? <laughs> How do I explain so many nuances? There is no way. How do you explain a meme to people who don't know how to pronounce meme? <laughs> before I leave, I'd like to say that criticism and dissent is very important. We have to fight for it. And uh, before I leave, I would like all of you to just think back. What were the first jokes we ever cracked as children? The first jokes we ever made, forget all politics, forget everything, when we had no brains, just what were the first jokes we made? The first jokes we ever made were jokes against our own teachers. <laughs> Why? Not because we hated them, no. We made those jokes because the teachers were powerful, they controlled us, it was our only form of relief against their dictatorship. We needed that then and we need that today. It is an open, you've been a wonderful audience. My name is Zubish Man. Thank you.